We all have ideas about what car-centric America looks like. Strodes, freeways, big box stores. And we might think we know which cities are the biggest offenders, but today I'm gonna to use data to figure it all out and shame the worst of the worst. It's the 10 most car-centric US cities and it's coming up next. This is City Nerd, weekly content on cities and transportation. Viewer suggested topics, always more than welcome. And I do stash these away and ponder them for months. I actually got this one from viewer David Hu over nine months ago on one of my Q&A videos. Can we do a video of highway length per capita of major metropolitan areas? If we can combine those data with public transport ridership, there might be some interesting outcomes. By the way, I am still doing the occasional Q&A video. I'm just making them patron only for now. So I did like this idea for a video and what it kind of morphed into was bringing together different data sources to figure out what the most car centric cities in America are. I'll get to what those data sources are and how I used them, but first, kind of a who cares piece. The thesis of this video is that car dependency is a vicious cycle, in particular for the cities on this list, but this is a problem everywhere in the US. It's hard to say which of these elements comes first, but they all feed into each other. Your city, or probably the state DOT, builds and widens highways. People are induced to buy more cars, or your city attracts the kind of people who like to drive a lot. Either way, there's more driving, so now you've created a constituency for more roadway capacity projects, and the elected officials respond to that constituency by building more lanes. The thing that breaks this cycle is really not just one thing, it's good research, good activism, good political leadership. Those things can create a virtuous cycle, but the cities we're talking about today, unfortunately, have not really managed to change direction. The data we're gonna look at today includes both the producer side and the consumer side of this equation. So we can sort of view this cycle from different angles. A couple data sources for the supply side. One, I'm using the National Transit Database, and I'm using the same transit supply metric that I created for the undervalued cities video. The other source is FHWA Highway Statistics Table HM72, and I'm using its estimates of roadway miles per capita and freeway lane miles per capita for each urbanized area. The idea here is that not only do more roadway miles probably induce more people to drive, but it means the city is using more land area that could have been devoted to something more useful. And then on the consumption side, I'm using vehicle miles traveled per capita from the same table. And then I'm getting into census data today, which I think I have not done before on this channel for whatever reason. I'll be using table S0801, commuting characteristics by sex, from the American Community Survey five-year data set ending in 2020. If you aren't familiar with the ACS, it's more detailed than the decennial census you might be more familiar with. Anyway, S0801 looks at workers 16 years old and up, how they typically get to work, how many vehicles are available to them, and a few other things. So for this, I'm using the percent commuting by car for each metro area, and I also looked at car availability. The census categorizes this by whether a worker has access to zero, one, two, or three plus cars. I used this to create a car light index where I gave full credit for the proportion of people with zero cars and half credit for the proportion with one car. Okay, that's the data, and just to be clear, I'm doing this by metropolitan statistical area for the usual reasons. I find city boundaries to be a bit arbitrary for the reasons I talked about in my crime video. Fuller discussion there if you need it. And I did calculate all this for every metro area, over 250,000, but the resulting list was kind of boring, so I'm just going with a million and up. Fair warning, we're going to be looking at a lot of very bad things today, but when we get to the honorable mentions, I'm going to look at the 10 cities that fared the best by this criteria. So that's what we're doing, and let's just get into it. Number 10 is Charlotte, North Carolina. This is a city of contradictions. 
It topped my list of unexpectedly walkable neighborhoods. It's got one of the better situated NFL stadiums with decent light rail access. But despite having the beginnings of a useful transit network and some walkable central neighborhoods, the census numbers are pretty bad. 87% of people in the region use a car as their primary means of getting to work, and it's only 1% each for transit and walking. Just to give you a baseline, here's how the Charlotte metro area's ACS numbers stack up against the national numbers, which include everything, small towns, rural areas. So it's not great, and be warned, it just gets worse from here. Number nine is the Inland Empire, which the US government in its infinite wisdom has determined to be a separate metro area from LA. So let's take that at face value. On its own, it's the 12th largest metro area in the US, bigger than San Francisco, Oakland, Seattle, Tacoma, or Minneapolis, St. Paul. Well, the Inland Empire has two central cities as well, San Bernardino and Riverside. And this is what the downtowns of those two cities look like, which probably explains why the Inland Empire is on this list. Well, besides the fact that it featured in both my ginormous interchanges and my terrible transit videos, the Inland Empire has absolutely the craziest car ownership numbers. Just 2% of ACS respondents had no cars, and only 13% had access to just one car. That is by far the lowest of any of the cities I've looked at. Would love to hear your theories about this down in the comments. Number eight is Grand Rapids, Michigan, possibly America's sneakiest 1 million person metro area. You know, I get asked from time to time when I do these lists, well, have you been to all of these cities? And the answer is no, I haven't literally been to every city in the US. And Grand Rapids does fall into that category. I could be talked into checking it out though. One of my chief downtown gentrification indicators is brew pub access, and Grand Rapids seems to be doing all right on this front. Number seven is Richmond, Virginia. This is the only one on the list that really surprised me, but it just rates poorly across all the criteria. You're gonna see a lot of the cities on this list have downtown freeway loops, or at least something close to it, and interchanges that take up a lot of prime urban real estate. I am a fan of extending the Acela Corridor to Richmond next, but there's some work to do here. Number six is Oklahoma City. I'm probably preaching to the choir if I say downtown freeways are bad. New York essentially gets this right, well, at least Manhattan, and Vancouver definitely has it figured out. I'm happy to entertain the argument that some freeway access in your city is good for freight or the economy or whatever, but I'll probably be skeptical. But I am gonna get super controversial right now and state unequivocally that you should not have loop ramps downtown. Just an amazing use of prime urban land. It says something about a city's values when you see this, and what it says is not good. Number five is Raleigh, North Carolina. So yes, I'm looking at metro areas here, not cities proper, but you have to say, Raleigh's city limits are pretty wild. There are huge swaths of urbanized land that have this very suburban development pattern where they apparently just didn't bother with sidewalks. How are you supposed to walk or take transit if you can't even walk anywhere from your own front door? Well, the ACS data say people just don't do it. Also, you may have gathered from watching this channel, I do always feel like you can tell a lot about a city from what its sports venues look like. This is PNC Arena, where the Carolina Hurricanes of the NHL play. 10 out of 10, no notes. Number four is Tulsa, Oklahoma. This one isn't surprising since it was such an egregious offender in my freeway heavy downtowns list. I mean, I guess they thought the remedy to burning down Black Wall Street was to drive a downtown freeway ring through the ruins. It's pretty sick stuff. And why on earth does a city the size of Tulsa need this level of car infrastructure anyway? Get over yourselves. Also, just a truly staggering amount of service parking downtown. I don't even know if this is redeemable. Maybe just start all over. Number three is Kansas City. 
Casey is like a greatest hits of things I always roast cities for. Huge interchanges within the city limits. A downtown ring road that eats up a ton of acreage and isolates neighborhoods from downtown and is kind of an environmental calamity. Bad NFL stadium and ballpark sighting. Awful MLS stadium sighting. Enormous racetrack with thousands of parking stalls that go unused 99% of the time. It's all there. The transit situation is not good. I mean, it's free, but maybe this is a case of you get what you pay for. Okay, I've still got the bottom two to come, as well as the 10 metro areas that are the least car-centric. A bit of housekeeping first. If you're in the Vegas area on October 22nd, I'm going to be speaking at the TEDx event in the East Downtown District. The theme is climate solutions, and I'm not going to spoil my topic, but it's going to be about as ridiculous as everything else I do on this channel. This is going to be a good event, though. Ferguson's is a very fun venue for this kind of thing, so RSVP at the link in the description if you're planning to come. Also, as usual, drop a like on the video, hit the subscribe as those things do help the channel, and certainly direct support via Patreon is always appreciated. Sub count check. The channel now has enough subscribers to fill Ben Hill Griffin Stadium in Gainesville, home of the Florida Gators. We might be stuck on SEC venues for a while. Eh, we'll see. Let's hit the 10 best really quick. It is kind of an interesting list. Starting at 10, I've got San Juan, Portland, New Orleans, Honolulu, Philadelphia, Boston, Chicago, DC, the Bay Area, and this one's a surprise, New York. Quick peek under the hood, just to point out what a huge outlier New York is. I imagine you already know it has way more transit service per capita, but look at what that enables. Here are the 10 cities I looked at, including cities over 250K that have the highest percentage of zero car ACS respondents. It's just a complete wipeout. Huge honorable mention to Lancaster, PA. The mid-sized northeastern cities really do overperform on this index. One dishonorable mention, if I had used the 250K population threshold, it would have knocked our numbers one and two cities down to two and three. And it's kind of a surprising one. It's Asheville, North Carolina, and it's just bad across every metric I looked at. Number two is Birmingham, Alabama. Birmingham showed up in my Freeway Heavy Downtowns video, so again, not much of a surprise. It was the worst of all the cities I looked at in terms of mode share. 92% of ACS respondents use a personal motor vehicle as their primary way to get to work. It's about 1% transit and 1% walk. You have to say, the American South is really coming up big on this list. And on that note, number one is Nashville, Tennessee. Nashville has, according to the FHWA data, by far the highest VMT per capita of any city I looked at for this list. I gotta say I'm skeptical about the number they're showing. 52.7 miles a day per capita? Somebody please tell me there's a calculation error here. Nashville is bad by every metric though, and it's another city that just loves its downtown freeway loop. And let's look at Nissan Stadium because I always feel like what a city does with its stadium is a microcosm of its overall attitude towards urbanism. This is the kind of stadium setup you'd expect to see deep in the suburbs, but this is right on the Cumberland River, directly across from downtown. You'd think this would be prime developable land, especially in a city where housing is getting expensive. I mean, close to half a million dollars is a lot for this part of the country. Someone down in the comments, please explain Nashville to me. And that's all I got. Thanks for joining today and thanks to the patrons for keeping this channel's finances solvent. It's certainly not a given from week to week, so it's very much appreciated. Keep the great topic suggestions coming. I'll be back with a new episode next week and I'll see you then.